Project Gemini, two weeks in space. From the CBS News Space Center in New York, here again is Walter Cronkite. And let us go directly to Houston, the manned space center, and the voice of Gemini Control, Paul Haney. Gemini Control, Houston here at 189 hours, 18 minutes into the flight of seven. Chris Kraft in the last few minutes suggested somewhat, more than somewhat facetiously, that perhaps Wally Shira and Tom Stafford didn't like the seven orbit for their rendezvous attempt and uh, indicating maybe the 161 circular would be more to their liking than the 161.5 in which seven is right now. This message was conveyed up to seven over Ascension and Frank Borman and Jim Lovell uh, joined right in the fun. The conversation went like this. Twenty seven, Houston, how do you read? that Wally and Tom were unhappy with your orbit. They're waiting on a 161 circular. your present orbit is? 27, have we given you your present orbit? Can you please give us our present orbit? Roger. It is 161.5 circular. What that was about is the exact orbit in which Gemini 7 is now flying. Uh, two days ago, on Thursday, uh, they, let's see, was it Thursday? Yes, they circularized their orbit uh, to the exact point which they expected to be met by Gemini 6. In circularizing the orbit, using stars as their guidance signals on navigation, uh, the, uh, the two astronauts, Borman and Lovell, put their orbit almost exactly on target. The target was 161 uh, nautical miles uh, high, or 185 statute miles. They're a little bit higher than that by about a half a mile, just enough uh, so the decay rate in another four days will bring them almost exactly on that 161 mile height. And that was a jocular reference to the fact they aren't on the exact uh, height now, and that might have been why Wally Shira and Tom Stafford didn't go at this particular time. A pretty uh, good joke among experts. Here is film of Gemini Control at the moment when the shutdown came this morning, at that critical, crucial moment. We have no sound on this. We're not permitted sound in there, but you can see the calm with which Chris Kraft and his team of flight directors uh, watched the developing operations. That was uh, Chuck Berry, the doctor in the glasses you saw a moment ago. There's obviously no excitement, no panic there. They've seen these happen before, they're concerned but they're a smoothly functioning team of experts. They've never seen this happen in manned space flight before. They have practiced what might happen in manned flight. For a few seconds there, it was purely a choice of Wally Shiraz as to whether he and his co-pilot ejected from that spacecraft or sat it out. They chose to sit it out the right decision. As you can see in those pictures, there was no panic, no excitement at Gemini uh, control in Houston, despite what might have been uh, fluttering uh, in the hearts of those men who were in charge of this flight. And Gemini uh, six pilots are now back at Mila and are getting out of their suits while Gemini seven continues in its 120th orbit, uh, passing over South Africa now just about to go over Africa again. 
It is preparing for an important experiment when it comes back over the United States on this next pass. At over the White Sands, New Mexico proving grounds, uh, they will attempt to establish contact through a high-powered light beam called a laser, uh, turned into a communications route with a uh, laser beam on the ground at White Sands. They have been told, however, not to use too much fuel to try the experiment. They have contacted one laser beam in six days, one out of a Hawaii station. The rest of the time, the laser stations on the ground in Hawaii, White Sands, and Ascension Island have been covered by clouds. And the Ascension station was out for some days. I don't know whether it's back or not yet. Uh, the Ascension laser beam, because of a missing part that they didn't have to replace uh, immediately. Uh, Hawaii, they, they saw the laser beam for the first time last night, but uh, were not able to communicate with it. This Gemini 6 was scrubbed uh, just uh, exactly uh, two hours ago to this very minute when uh, the, uh, after second and a half of ignition, the engines shut down. George Herman, who is now out at McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis, has spent quite a bit of time at the Martin plant in Baltimore where these Titan IIs are built. And he can tell us something about that automatic cutoff device and just what happened this morning. George? Well, Walter, I think the first thing that we should note probably is that this is a triumph for the safety equipment on the uh, Martin Titan. After all, the Titan was designed originally as an intercontinental ballistic missile. And then the Martin company put a great deal of time and energy with the experts from NASA into what they called man rating it which is to say making it safe to carry something far more delicate than a nuclear warhead to carry a human being. And you may recall that the first word we got from NASA was that what might have gone wrong, although I believe that's now fairly well discredited, is that it went over to one of the other two redundant systems, either the redundant uh, control system, the redundant hydraulics, or to the redundant uh, electronic system, so that both of these were means to shut it down. It's really rather remarkable when you think about it, and no mean engineering feat, that you could shut down those seven million horsepower in a fraction of a second, stop it dead in its tracks, stop everything altogether. And now, uh, having done that rather remarkable feat, I imagine the silent men, the engineers that you never hear about, the people who are only heard about when something does go wrong, the safety engineers who designed the equipment to stop it, I imagine they're both melancholy that the flight uh, failed, but extremely gratified that their safety equipment worked so very well. There is a lot of work to be done, of course, still, besides the regular turnaround. Nobody's mentioned it, but if my recollection serves me rightly, there are in the valves uh, before the engines, there are certain bursting diaphragms which are broken when the pressure reaches a certain uh, value, and those will now have to be replaced. That means that part of the engine will have to be open and these new frangible diaphragms put in so as uh, fuel can be kept from getting to where it uh, might make contact and burst into flame before pressure has reached the proper values. So there is a certain amount of turnaround work to be done. Uh, one other element, uh, I don't know whether you've mentioned it or not, but the other element is, of course, that when the fuel is pumped out, which takes a number of hours, after safety margins have been properly established, it won't probably begin for a while yet, after it's pumped out, it'll have to be chilled. Not that the fuel and the oxidizer and the Titan, are, they're, not, they're storable, so they don't have to be kept cold like locks. It's a fairly simple proposition. They have to be cooled so they'll shrink down so they can pack more fuel into the cylinders. But all in all, what happened today is a, is a triumph for the men who, fortunately, up to now, have been totally invisible. The safety engineers who designed the extra margins of safety to protect and save the human beings on board. It was really, uh, although I don't suppose anybody will think about it in the disappointment, it was really a remarkable achievement. Indeed it was, George. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of reason for gratification uh, throughout the space program in this uh, failure today. As they told us so many times down at the Cape throughout the space program in the early days when we were having quite a lot of failures with our unmanned uh, space uh, uh, missiles in the early days of testing, they said that every failure proved something, that they were learning with every failure. And it was a little bit hard to tell the American people and even to accept ourselves as we stood down there and watched missile after missile blow up or tumble or fall or not make a, uh, its a... Uh, uh, fulfill its accomplished mission, that they, we were learning something. But it's quite clear we do. And today, what they proved out, first of all, as you suggest, was the safety system built into the booster itself, and then the men 
every one of them approved himself out uh, there in the cockpit of the spacecraft itself and in mission control. A smoothly functioning team that uh, when the emergency came, uh, they had found that their training fit the situation and uh, we have two healthy astronauts and a healthy spacecraft and booster ready to go on another day.